Greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to the live streaming of our English service from Armenian Brotherhood Bible Church from Pasadena. Today is April 11th, Sunday after the resurrection, and in the Armenian tradition, we call it the New Sunday. Let us bring our hearts and our minds and put them in the presence of our Lord and Savior and ask for guidance. Heavenly Father, our Savior in Jesus Christ, our Counselor in the Holy Spirit, this is the day that you have created. Thank you for giving us life and promising us to give it abundantly when we abide in you and follow you. Lord, we entrust ourselves at this moment and may the reading and the preaching of your word penetrate through our hearts and minds and change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have said, the Sunday after the resurrection is called the New Sunday, in which believers and the church, they embrace the victory in Christ as something fulfilled, and it will reach its culmination in the future. Despite all the ups and downs that we continue to live in this life. Today I want to focus on one of the most realistic yet challenging statements that Christ has made during his Last Supper discourses as he was addressing his disciples and giving them a heads up for what they should be prepared for. This is the statement or this is the phrase that Jesus said. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And this is from John chapter 16, verse 33. So, these words come as conclusion to a conversation that went or took place between Jesus and his disciples as they were sitting in the Last Supper context. The disciples used to hear divine truth uh, through Jesus' parables and teachings. But now, just before this verse, they were telling Jesus that now we can see that you're talking plainly of yourself and now we believe that you are the Messiah. You are the one who we were waiting for. We see in you the fulfillment of God's promises. So after this statement by the disciples, Jesus warns them as if saying, don't be that much sure. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus was addressing both his immediate disciples and all those who were going to follow his name through faith. He was referring both to the tribulations and the troubles starting that evening and those that were going to come in the decades and the centuries to follow. So, what did Jesus tell his disciples? I told you all these things when Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you. These are the words that he started telling his disciples. And if we go throughout the entire chapter 16, we come across four times where Jesus said, I told you these things, I told you these things, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogues. I'm reading from John 16, first two verses. They will make you outcasts from the synagogues. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you think that he is offering service to God. I am telling you so that you know what you should be expecting. 
so that you do not stumble. Scandalizete. This is the Greek word. Literally, it means that there is a rock and you do not see that, and you stumble and you fall down. Jesus does not promise smooth pathways, but he promises to be with us and with his disciples to walk us through all these bumpy obstacles in life. That's why he says, take heed. I'm warning you. Think about this. I'm telling you ahead of time. So that, and that is the second element in his phrase, so that you may have peace in me. When we think about ourselves as human beings, we will remember that, or we know that, we all have our corners of peace. We all create our corners of peace. Where we can retreat after a, a long and difficult day, where we can take asylum anytime life and circumstances press on us. It could be our reading corner, our headphones, our garage, the seashore, our family members. We create our peace corners. But the peace that we can find in Christ is at another level. The base of the peace in Christ lies in what he had done on the cross and how he reconciled us with the Father. And the power of that peace working in us depends how much we embrace the grace and the gift of peace in our hearts and minds. Jesus said, peace I live with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. So there is this contrast between what the world gives you and what Jesus gives you. And let us ask, what is the world in this statement where Jesus is talking about? Maybe this is the third element in his phrase. In John, the word world is used nearly 60 times, six zero. In several places, world is used first to refer to the multitudes or the masses, the people. For instance, in 1219, because of the wide publicity given to the raising of Lazarus, the Pharisees are worried and they say, the world has gone after him, the multitudes, the masses. Or when Jesus' brothers tell him, Oh, in order to publicize yourself in a more efficient way, maybe you need to go to Jerusalem during the Feast of the Tabernacles. Show yourself to the world, they said in 714. But there is another meaning also for the world. The Greek word is cosmos, and it refers to the creation. First is the multitudes, the masses, the second one is creation. In the beginning of uh, the Gospel of John, we read that Jesus came into the world, into the creation, where we are part of it. Also, in a third meaning, the world refers to humanity, us, part of the creation, where we are in a special relationship with God. And this relationship, and in this relationship, God loves us and wants us to follow him, to be obedient to him. And that's why John, when he was giving the miniature of the entire gospel, he said, for God so loved the world. Yes, us as human beings, because we were created in his image. Multitudes, the creation, us as people, and sometimes, and this is even during uh, or within Gospel of John, the world is that part of the world or the humanity that is under the domination of the power of the evil. Three times, on three occasions, the devil is named the ruler of this world. But he doesn't have, the, the devil doesn't have power on Jesus. This is in 1430. 
and it was cast out to be judged, 1231 and 1611. These are all in the context of the Gospel of John. But when we come to the phrase that is the focus of our today's message, John 16:33, the world in that context speaks about the fallen world, which is under the dominion of the devil. And this is how Jesus makes the contrast, draws the contrast. If you abide in me, there you will find peace. But if you decide to follow the world, there will be no peace. And I'm telling you, because you are following me, there will be tribulations. You will be in trouble. And I'm telling you, so that you do not stumble. The third element, take heart. Or maybe the fourth. So this is where the good news part is coming. But take heart. Imagine yourself reading this verse, John 16, 33. And all of a sudden, when you get to the point where Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you have peace. In this world you will have trouble. And all of a sudden, the power is gone in your neighborhood. And you cannot continue the verse, right? Imagine. You just close the Bible and try to go to sleep. What would you think about yourself as follower of Christ or someone who has decided to dedicate his life to Christ? You know, you come to the point where he says, in this world, you will find trouble, tribulations. I mean, all these things that Jesus warned us will happen. The world will hate us because it hated Jesus. The world will not love us because we do not belong to this world and they will, the world will even persecute us because they persecuted Jesus before. If we stop here, we'll either think about ourselves as people who like to suffer or people who like to follow a religious figure that enjoys to be persecuted, canceled, or we might end up being the most miserable people of all if we just stop here. But as always, the Bible has this divine intervention, divine but, pites, sagain. This is how it continues. You, in this world, you will have trouble, but, and this is the divine intervention, take heart, I have overcome the world. Thank God that the script doesn't stop here. The scripture doesn't stop here. Jesus does not stop at the news of the tribulation. Even if sometimes our reading is interrupted. What follows is the good news that Jesus has overcome the world. Many throughout the history had come and subjugated the world. Whether the old or the new world such as the Seljuks from Central Asia, Philip of Macedonia, who reached the gates of India, the Ottomans who conquered the heart of Europe. People came and, over, and overcame the, the world. But Jesus' overcoming is totally different type. Maybe four points will help us understand. Contrary to those leaders who dominated through power of arms and politics, Jesus overcame the world by the power of his kingdom, which is grace, forgiveness, and love. It's kind of power that crushes the heart, the ego, when despite all we do, Jesus comes with the language of grace, forgiveness, and love. If Jesus had come to condemn every evildoer and make them pay back for their sins, no one would have survived. He overcame 
with a different style. Jesus' victory, the second point, was on the battlefield of the cross where he overcame the most vulnerable point of our human nature. Our vulnerability to sin and feeling of shame. Yes, this is our life story. And what does the devil do? The devil runs this script in front of us, in our imagination, so that we feel ourselves deserted, miserable. You're abandoned. You're such a bad guy. But Jesus overcame this vulnerability. And in a third meaning, Jesus' way of overcoming the world was marked through his victory on the temptations as he was leading a life on this earth and leading his earthly ministry. That's why the author of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 4, verses 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, as we have just said. Finally, the victory that our Lord secured over the world was anchored on the day of the resurrection. That was the culmination. Where he did not let the human hope an aspiration for a glorious life to be caged behind a tomb rock. Jesus' victory touched our helplessness and our hopelessness and made us realize that this is not the life that we were destined for. The pain, the loneliness, the shame, and the spiritual agony, these were not meant to be the dominating agenda of our existence. That was the way he overcame the world. Jesus' victory lifted us, lifted up our hearts to see what is coming at the culmination of our times. And finally, when we hear this good news, we have to ask ourselves, how do we become overcomers? Well, Jesus overcame the world. That's good news. But what does it have to do with me? If I want to become an overcomer, what do I need to do? God does not need trophies, dear brothers and sisters. God is not looking or is not in search of victory medals. God is the creator. God is the eternal victorious. But God in Christ overcame the world on our behalf and for us. Jesus' victory does not mean that life will be immune from ups and downs, but he will be always with us. Listen to what Psalm 91 says in verse 5 and 6. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by the day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. Like four things. These are all realities, the Word of God says. These things happen because of the fallen nature of this earth and the fallen nature of our humanity. There will be the night, the arrows flying, the pestilence in the darkness and the destruction. But in all this, we will not be afraid. And that's where Christ helps us to keep our focus and peace. Jesus claims all victory and we identify our victory in him. So that's the secret. We identify that same victory when he does it for us. Just like when you follow a favorite sports team. When they win, you think that you won. And you believe and you feel that you won. And you start arguing with your siblings or your friends that who is the best. I mean, they don't have any connection with me, but I identify with them. 
Well, this is like an unearthly illustration, but what about God who created us and who wanted to reclaim this land, reclaim those hearts and spirits? That's the victory, and we just need to embrace that, to identify ourselves with that. Until the time when Jesus returns again to take his church, his bride, to the everlasting life, we will find ourselves struggling between these two worlds. One is the world under the power and the influence of the evil one, and the other is God's kingdom under the sovereign rule of God. These two systems are not merely different in their approach or emphasis. They are in opposition to each other. And the heart of this opposition is spiritual and moral. So when we love the world and when we are friends with the world, we are really aligning ourselves with the world and saying yes to the temptations of the evil one and thus opposing God, his values, and what he is seeking to do through us. The world and God's kingdom are dramatically opposed. But we find ourselves between, between these two. Sometimes when we are honest enough, we'll see that there is the mixture of both aspects in our hearts. We love God. We are faithful members of his body. But we also allow the world to creep into our lives and influence on some ways. In fact, we can say that all of us fail in this area to a varying degree. We love God and we obey his commandments. Yet, during the week, we have to bear the secular atmosphere of our jobs and our colleagues, and sometimes even tempted to adopt their values. This is the realism. Christ said, you will be facing trouble, persecution. They will hate you because they hated me. They will cancel you because they always wanted to cancel me. But today, we still can live differently. The difference lies in the way we should live and anticipate. We can either complain that we are struggling against the tides and the principalities that are above our ability, that we cannot stand against, or we can live with the psychology and the reality of the victory that we have experienced in Christ, even if the world thinks that we are still losers. In this world, in order to conclude, in this world and on the pathways of his earthly ministry, Jesus stood against the world and said, you did your worst to me, but I emerged victorious. The good news is that when we abide in him and follow him, then we can rightfully claim that victory too. That victory is yours. Just claim it and live with that spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for doing everything for us. Thank you for going victoriously through the parade on Palm Sunday and on the cross and on the resurrection day. And here we are in the new Sunday. And we want to embrace that victory with you. Thank you for walking through us in the tough circumstances of this life. And now, Lord, you hear all the prayers that come out of our hearts. Help us to claim that victory and walk with you and abide in you. In Jesus' name, amen.